Well, we've been talking about the coming king. This uh, Christmas, one of the highlights for me is writing this devotional. And if you didn't get one of these, let me know, and I'll make sure I put one of these in your hand. This is a 30-day devotional uh, on the coming king. And I talk about a huge number of subjects in here, both of, of Christ's first coming and of his second coming. And uh, there is so much scripture on the coming king. Uh, different names, different pictures of him, what he will do, an incredible deta detail about his rule on planet Earth. And uh, so it's just, that was just such a highlight for me to write that. You don't, you don't understand. I'm, I'm digging into these scriptures and it's just blessing me as I'm writing it. And then I write this devotional and post it on my Facebook uh, page every day and then gather those together in this booklet. That's what it is. And I think after I read it over again, I'm thinking, no, that's not it. It was better than that. <laughs> You're missing it. Which, by the way, we can all do. Do you understand? You can dig into the scriptures and you can have that experience for yourself. Aren't we all interested in the coming king? How many of us want Jesus to come back in 2022? <laughs> All of us. Now, as you raise your hand, I want to ask this question. Why do you want him to come back? Is it, you don't have to raise your hand on this one. I'm just asking. Is it because you want to escape this madness we're in? Yes. yes. Or is it because you want to be with him? Both. Both. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, that's great. I get it. But I think a lot of people are interested in the, the coming kingdom, not because they want to hang out with the king, but because they want to get rid of all this mess, all this struggle, all the troubles we have in our world. And there's stuff coming at me every day that I really think I have been translated to a different dimension because what's coming at me just seems like complete insanity. And it's so crazy. And it's like, even so, come Lord Jesus. Would you please come back and put this mess in order? And here's the cool part. Oh, he's coming. Absolutely is coming. Whether it's 2022 or 3 or 2548, I don't know. But he is coming. Now, I can tell you, it does not look like it could possibly be 2548 to me. It looks like this world won't endure another 300 years going the wacky way it's going. It's just kind of lost all touch with reality in my, from my mind. But by the way, I'm old, and I understand that's why old people say that, you know. So if that's it, okay, then if it's just because I'm old, then praise God, I'm old. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. So we've talked about through this series uh, some questions and the answers, and we want to come to the Q&A today. And in order to do that, I've got to be fair. We've had a bunch of questions already. So I'm going to do some questions and answers. We'll look at the scriptures together. And I want you to get your Bible out. So if this is your Bible, then get it out. Right now, turn to the Bible app. There are no notes. There's just announcements on the YouVersion events today. And the reason is, is because I want this to be informal. I want it to be question and answer. But I have some questions in the past that people have written on their prayer cards, and I want to answer these. So the first one comes from Lindsay, and she says, how bad does the world have to get before tribulation? Now, that is an awesome question. How bad does it have to get? How bad can it get? Is the world worse today than it was in the height of the final solution that Hitler brought on the world? I don't know. That's a judgment call. You might say, yes, it's worse. You might say, can it get worse than that? Well, I can tell you on the authority of God's word, yes, it can get worse than that. That was bad. But whether it is bad as then, I don't know. Um, man, there is sin in the world, and it is amazing how much uh, sin is called good and and good is called evil in our world today. And so that's one of the things. But Jesus actually addressed this in Matthew 24, uh, verse 32. And then I'll look at 36 to 39. I don't have time to teach this whole thing. But this is the Olivet Discourse. And this is in the context of the end times. So Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus is speaking mostly of the tribulation. 
as Tommy called it when he was a little guy, he called it the seven years of bad luck. The seven year tribulation period. And here's what Jesus says in Matthew 24, 32. Now, learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. Now, in another place, he said, you can discern the signs of the weather, but you can't discern the signs of the times. How come? And the answer is, not many people are looking through a biblical lens. And so it makes it difficult for us to see. Then he goes on in verse 36. However, no one knows when the hour, day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. Now, check this out. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties, weddings, right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them, swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. That's when he talks about one grinding at the, at the mill, one is taken, the other left. One's in the field, one's taken, the other left. Now, listen, listen. That has nothing to do with the rapture. That has to do in the context with the taking in judgment. One dies during the tribulation, the other's left. It seems random to us, but it's God's purpose is being fulfilled. Does that make sense? So don't try to stick the rapture in there. That's not what that's talking about. He's talking about Noah. In other words, right up to the end, life will be going on like nothing ever is going to happen. And it will get worse and worse and worse. And we can see that. There was, in the 1800s, the most popular theology concerning the end times was that the church is going to get the world better and better and better, and then Jesus would come back and rule the kingdom after we got the earth squared away. That was in the temperance movement, get rid of alcohol, prohibition. Uh, that was in that time period where, where the church thought the world was getting better and better and better. And then came World War I, and then came World War II, and I can promise you there are not many that hold on to that theology much anymore, believing that the church is getting the world better and better. The world is going down and around and around like that bowl in your bathroom <laughs> is what it kind of reminds me of, whatever that is. In those days before the, okay, people didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. So in other words, things will be basically normal in terms of people just going about life when the end comes. And I believe strongly the next thing on God's calendar in heaven is the rapture of his bride. Jesus is coming back to take his bride away with him. And then judgment, God's wrath will be poured out on the earth. And uh, so that's next. All right, next question from Lindsay is, what is the second death? You ever heard that term, second death? That's a Bible term, second death. All right, first of all, what's the first death? Physical, Physical death. And it's the death of separation. Remember, the wages of sin is death. That's not physical. That's spiritual death. Separation from God. And then in the end, let's just read about it. In Revelation 21, 8, the cowards, unbelievers, that's the one to circle, the corrupt murderers, the immoral who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now let me ask you, how many of you have ever told a lie? I, some of you raised your hands and some of you are proving you're liars. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Don't get all cranked and just being silly. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're, no, we're liars. No, that's not our identity. Do you understand? My identity is a saint. I am holy and blameless in his sight because I have trusted in Jesus Christ and the righteousness of Christ is credited to my account. So although I lie... And to say I don't sin, I'd be deceiving myself and the truth was not in me. First John 1. 
I still am not a liar. That is not my identity. My identity is a saint, holy and blameless in his sight because of the blood of Jesus Christ credited to my account. So that's not who we're talking about here. We're talking about those who aren't believers. And it says, all these liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And so they die physically, they die forever separation in God. And we'll talk about this more in a minute. All right, Jeanette asked, how will I see my husband as a friend or as a husband? Same with my parents. Those are great questions. Those are great questions. Jesus actually answered that question in Mark chapter 12, verse 23. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They believed you lived on earth, you died, that was it. By the way, do you understand there's a huge portion of Christianity that still believes that today? They're Sadducees in theology, even though they wouldn't admit it. This earth is all you get. It's the best it gets. You die, that's it. And uh, so... Uh, but the Sadducees asked, trying to mock Jesus, there's leave a right marriage in Scripture. That means if a husband died before his wife gave birth to a son, his brother, unmarried brother, was to marry her, and the first son would be the son of the deceased brother. And the reason that's important in Israel, in the, in the context of the nation of Israel, is because each person received an allotment of land. And who does that land pass to? It passes to the son. Well, he died before he had a son, so the next son is raised up for that. That's exactly what was going on. Kinsman redeemer with Boaz and Ruth. You, you with me, that story? And so the, the Sadducees are mocking the resurrection by saying, this woman married a brother, he died. The next brother married her, he died. The next brother married her, uh, seven times. Seven brothers died. First you would think, she's pretty dangerous, <laughs> right? Of course, they're just making a hypothetical, exaggerated point. It's hyperbole to make their point. Whose wife will she be? in the resurrection, because we don't believe in resurrection, so that's silly. We just proved to you how stupid the resurrection is. Jesus replied, your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. Whoa. <laughs> For when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. We don't become angels. That is fairy tale foolishness. Hollywood promotes this. The world system promotes it. When you die, you do not become an angel. Jesus is saying, like angels who don't have spouses because they don't procreate, so too with our new resurrection body, we will not have spouses because there will be no reason for procreation. You follow that? You say, yeah, but he or she is so awesome and I... Yeah, they'll be your closest brother or sister in Christ. That's not bad, right? And by the way, both of you without a sin nature anymore. How does that sound? Just get to hang out and enjoy one another without any sin or corruption or decay or anything going on there. How awesome is that? Brothers and sisters in Christ. And I've told you the story how important it is to me that this is in the scripture because Donna died, and now I've been married to Kathy for 33 years, 32 years, 33 this year. Um, that would be weird. Like, two wives? No. No, but two closest sisters in Christ, and now Kathy and Donna can know each other without any weirdness? How awesome is that? Think about how cool that is. And they're my, they'll be my closest sisters in Christ. And we'll all be brothers and sisters in Christ in eternity. Now, with that in mind, I want you to catch this. Luke 16, 24. This is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The one thing I want you to get is you retain your ID. You are still who you are. You're Dusty, and you're Chris, and you're Cindy, and you're um, Jen, 
Do, do you get that idea? You are still who you are after you have died physically and go to heaven. You still have your ID. You are the same person. You have memories of some kind. Um, because we're told in here, the rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have pity. Send Lazarus. So the rich man knew who he was. He knew who Abraham was. He knew who Lazarus was. He asked Abraham to send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool his tongue because he's tormented in these flames. I love when the sophisticates say, well, there are no flames in hell. Really, because Jesus thought there were. You must be smarter than him. <laughs> what a bunch of foolishness. Then the rich man said, verse 27, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him back to my father's house, for I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end in this place of torment. Now, I want you to catch what's going on here. First of all, I do not believe that is a parable. It does not have the makings of a parable. Jesus never said the kingdom of heaven is like. He said there was a rich man and there was a man named Lazarus and they both died. And, and Lazarus went to Abraham to heaven and the rich man went to hell and they had this conversation something Jesus was privy to know through the inspiration, leadership of the Holy Spirit, I believe he is telling us about an actual story that took place. And you will have trouble making this a parable. The only reason why they don't want it to be real is because they don't want to give Jesus that much knowledge to know what was going on in the netherworld. You get it? Nah, he can't know that. He's just making this up. I believe Jesus is telling a real story about a real rich man and a real guy named Lazarus. And uh, Abraham, obviously, is real. So they all retain their idea. By the way, Jesus said this. He got, he tried, they tried to stone him for it. He said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Who's that? Actual Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Well, you're not 50 years old. Abraham lived 2,000 years ago. You've seen Abraham? Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. You getting that? That is profound. By the way, they picked up stones to stone him because he just said, I'm God. I am the great I am. That's what he just claimed right there. And they knew exactly what he was saying. And they did not like that at all. They, they accused him of blasphemy. Blasphemy is why the Sanhedrin, the high priest, took Jesus to be crucified. When he gets to Pilate, he changes the charges. But the reason they actually delivered him to death was because he claimed to be God. But then when they get to Pilate, they know that isn't going to work for Pilate for a death sentence, and they change it to he claimed to be king. And uh, by the way, he claimed both things. All right, does that make sense? Do you follow that? All right, next one. What about my sins? Uh, what about all of my sins? Well, I have to explain them. Um, they're all covered, but yes, you will stand before Jesus. Now, I want you to get there are three judgments, big judgments that are proclaimed in Scripture. The first one that relates to those of us who know Christ is in 2 Corinthians 5.10. For me, we must all stand before Christ to be judged. In the um, Greek, it says we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Now, that is not a works salvation. Paul explains this in more detail in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. So if you can turn there and follow along. I know I'm moving through a lot of scripture, but you can do this. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. So first of all, you have the foundation, Jesus Christ, in your life. He is undergirding your life. You put your full weight and trust in him. Verse 12. Anyone who builds on that foundation 
may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. So yes, your sins, your works will be tried by fire to see what you built them out of. Wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, and precious stone. Now, I think it's interesting that the wood, that the works are tried by fire. Because if they were just looked at, I don't believe you could look at the works and tell. I believe we look at one another's works and we're amazed many times. And we may be surprised when that gets tried by fire, it burns right up. I've thought about this a lot. I want to give you my opinion, all right, on what I think is determines whether something is wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stones. I believe it has to do with your motive. What is your motive for doing the good work? If your motive is to get glory, I believe it'll burn up. If your motive is to seem spiritual, I believe it will burn up. If your motive is to one-up the other people around you, maybe out of pride or some other impure motive, I believe it'll burn up. I don't believe you can look. We can't look at the works and know which is wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, and precious stone. Does that make sense? But when it's tried by fire, when your motive is pure, out of a heart only to honor the Lord, then those works will remain. Matter of fact, as they're tried by fire, they burn away any dross and get even more pure. I would suggest this. Now, these are mixing metaphors. I believe that they melt down the gold, silver, and precious stones, and that's the crown you lay at the feet of Jesus. The bigger the crown, the more the honor. Some people will be standing there like this. Lord, I love you. I think some people will be standing there like this. Here, Lord. <laughs> By the way, glorified bodies, absent of pride, no pride there. Are you with me? Only how much glory you can bring to the Lord. Now, like I say, that's mixing metaphors. That's my opinion, but I've, I've worked on this a lot. I've looked at this a lot, and I'd be curious if you have a, a different idea of what determines whether you're building with wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stone. It will be tried at the judgment seat of Christ. So every believer will be judged before Jesus in order to receive their rewards. That's what it says, verse 14. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. I love that. By the way, that has a lot to do right there with the security of the believer. Even ill-motived works or works that burn up, you still are saved. You just walk into eternity without all those works being able to be seen. Pretty cool. So that's the judgment seat of Christ. The second judgment is the judgment of the sheep and goats. When Jesus returns to earth at the end of the seven years of tribulation, the first thing he does after he wins the battle and secures the crown is he separates everyone who lived through the tribulation, which will be hundreds of millions, maybe billions of people lived through the tribulation. Some are believers, most are unbelievers. He will separate the believers from the unbelievers as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. And the sheep, he will say, come, enter, enjoy, experience the kingdom prepared for you by my father. And so the sheep, those who are believers who live through the tribulation, those are the ones that go into the millennial kingdom and populate repopulate the world, starting with all believers in their normal human bodies. Now, Jesus is going to take away disease. He's going to take away a lot of problems. There will still be death. There will still be rebellion. There will still be sin. For those humans that populate the kingdom, 
us, we have already put on our new resurrection body. If you're not one of those who live through the, you know, if we're raptured, all of us, and I believe we're already raptured, we come back in our resurrection body to reign and rule with Christ for a thousand years. So, does that make sense? You following that? And then the third judgment is Revelation 20. We call it the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. I wonder why we call it the great white throne judgment. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both small and great, standing before God. And the books were open, including the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. That's not the book of life. That's the books that record everything you've ever done, every word. Now watch. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire, the lake, this lake of fire is the second death. There we get it again. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So I would suggest those of us who are believers and the believers who lived through the millennium and now they're facing the great white throne, those believers will not stand in this judgment. It will be those who have rejected Jesus as their savior. And many will during the millennial kingdom. And they will stand before there. All the dead who have ever lived, who were unsaved, will stand in that judgment. Might take a while. I don't know how he's going to do it. And then they are thrown into the lake of fire. So they already died physically. Now they're died, they've died spiritually forever. By the way, they've already died spiritually too once. This is the second death, the second separation, the eternal separation from God, the second death. Does that make sense? Following that? All right. Meredith asked, Brenda asked, sorry, what if a person believes in Christ but hasn't lived as a believer? Well, wow, that's a great question. Two issues, real quick. Matthew 7 20. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven. What is the will of your Father in heaven? This is the will of my Father in heaven, that they would believe on me whom he has sent. Then Matthew 13, 24, Jesus tells the story of the wheat and the tares. Here's what I don't know as a pastor. There well could be tares in this room right now. Wheat, genuine believer, Heirs, fake believers. The ones who have the right answers but don't have a heart relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know that. If I knew who you are, I would, I would corner you and talk to you right nose to nose. You're with me, I, I talk to you. I don't know. But there is wheat and tares in the congregation. I know that's the picture. And Jesus said, at the end, it will be harvested the wheat will be put into the barn and the tares will be burned with fire. Fake. And so here's the two things that I want us to get from that. There are some people who claim to be believers who are not. Some of the people you say, are they, they are, they say they're saved, but they're not living for the Lord. How do I know they're actually saved? And the answer is you can't. The best you can do is look at their life and say, I have reason to suspect whether or not you know the Lord because of what I see you happening in your life. And therefore, I will treat you like an unbeliever. How do we treat an unbeliever? With hatred and disdain, right? Mockery and... No, we love them and we share Jesus with them. That's how you treat an unbeliever. You don't treat them with ugliness. Goodness gracious, just the opposite. You treat them with grace and with love. So if you suspect someone in your family or someone of your friends, say they know Jesus, but they don't, just keep sharing the gospel with them. They'll either trust in Jesus or get annoyed and you'll have a new friend. You have to get a new friend. But yeah, so we don't know. And that's part of the, that's part of the issue. 
All right, um, let me see. I think that's all my prepared questions. One, one more is what about after the thousand year reign? And that's where we come to the new heaven and new earth. You can read about it in Revelation 20, one and 22, Revelation 21 and 22. So after the thousand years, the heavens and the earth melt and God does a whole new work and brings a new one. So you can see that new heaven and new earth. So this is a overview of what I think are the end times. All right, that's the end of my prayer. I know that went way too long. Sorry, that was about a half an hour. But those were questions people already asked. So let's get to the question. Who has a question? All right, here's one in back. Where'd Mark go? <laughs> Come on, Phil. Sorry. Sorry. I know. I understand why you quit on me. I understand why you quit on me, man. It makes a lot of sense. My car here was... Uh, yes. Some yeah, you got Where's it. Yeah, Jim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sorry. <It's> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay's first question captured me because... And that was... Um, is the world... Can the world get any worse? And I don't remember how she ended it, but uh, so that we would know that the end is here, or something of that effect. Uh -huh. And I, mean, I want to ask if it's fair and biblical to contrast Satan's wrath through man, which is what we've been experiencing for 2,100 years, as the church of Jesus Christ. Nothing new under the sun. We just haven't experienced it here in the USA yet. As compared to when God pours out his wrath in the Great Tribulation. Is that a fair comparison and a fair contrast to help those who are amillennial or mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. flavor you want to pick? Is that fair, Pastor? Yeah, the... Um Satan is a copycat. That's what he does. Matter of fact, that's what Antichrist means. Antichrist doesn't mean against Christ, like we always think. Although he is against Christ, Antichrist means in place of Christ. So this is the Messiah that's going to come into the world and mimic what Jesus should do. He's going to consolidate the world kingdom. Everyone's going to fall under his sway, under his control. They're all going to believe it's going to be awesome. And then literally hell breaks loose. And the world goes into shambles like we have never seen. And God pours out his wrath in addition to man's choices that make it worse. So there are, there are human disasters that are created by humans. Through war, I would suggest something like nuclear war. If it happened right now, it would have to be nuclear war because you cannot kill a third of the world's population in seven years using bullets and bombs. You have to use some kind of mass killing. It could be chemical, it could be some neutron bomb that kills people and doesn't destroy cities, I don't know. But some kind of mass killing goes on that's caused by human warfare and then the resulting famine. But in addition to that, then there's God's wrath that is poured out. And God's wrath includes earthquakes and, and super volcanoes erupting and literally a meteor hitting, I think, the Pacific Ocean because it says one third of all the ships are destroyed. So we'd have to ask, I think a third of the ships are in the Pacific uh, as opposed to, uh, I don't know, the Atlantic maybe, who knows. But anyway, it, he sees a mountain hitting the earth on fire, uh, um, John says in the book of Revelation, and that would be some kind of meteor or comet hitting the earth, causing tsunamis, causing, um, um, you know, like, like nuclear night kind of thing. You get the idea from volcanoes and earthquakes like we have never seen before. Makes the San Francisco earthquake look like a baby. And that happens all over the world as God pours out his wrath on wicked humans with the purpose of leading them to repentance. Do you understand that? Do you understand when disaster happens to you, God wants to lead you to repentance? He, that's his purpose, is to draw you to him. You think, well, that repulses me. Well, then you're trusting in yourself instead of trusting in him. But that's what's going to go on. And so... 
what Satan is doing in pouring out his wrath on the earth is causing problems and conflicts and issues in our world. And he's found some new ways of separating people. There used to be Democrats and Republicans in the United States. Now there's progressives and moderates and Republicans and extreme right and all these different factions and each one building their territory and fighting against everybody else. And now there's the, the COVID has divided even those groups another time. Have you noticed that? I'm not saying which side you're on. I'm saying that's just true. And so more Satan can get people isolated, the more he can attack. And that's what he's trying to do for sure, Jim. So that it would be a, a picture of the wrath of God, except Satan isn't powerful like God. You do realize that Satan and God are not in this cosmic battle. And we're still wondering who's going to win. Who's the creator? Who's the created? Who's going to win the battle? Praise God. That's awesome. Yeah, great question. Someone else? Yes, Right here. It makes me so sad for the people that are going to be here for the tribulation. Amen. Um, even the ones who are martyred, although they're going to be yes. martyred, and yeah. that's going to be awesome for them. But, um, And I know we pray all the time, please just come today. Yes. But I don't want anybody living through that. Yes. So, um, I don't know, I just need to be telling everybody as much as I can Amen. about just Jesus and how to not be in those seven years. Amen. Um, yeah. And then I guess I do have a question. Like in the millennial kingdom, when we're ruling with Jesus, like what are we ruling? Okay. Like what are we going to be doing? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> awesome. All right, first, first point that you make yeah. is exactly right on. One of the things that those of us who hold to a pre-millennial return of Christ, rapture of the church, whether you're pre-trib, like I happen to be, I believe that the rapture is coming, Jesus is coming for his bride, to get us out of the wrath to come. But listen, listen, one of the critics, one of the complaints that that position has, especially among unbelievers, is that you act like you're so excited about Jesus coming back that you don't care about the people who are going to go through the tribulation. And Cindy, you have exactly the right attitude that blesses the Lord, because that should be our that should be our heart. It'd be like if you preach about hell and you're almost like, yeah, they get what they deserve. You with me? I mean, that dishonors the Lord. That's horrible. We should we should not even be able to talk about hell without grief and without hurt, thinking about those who are separated from God for eternity. That's exactly the right attitude. And when we talk about the rapture or we talk about end times, we need to talk about, please avoid this. There's a way out. It's through Jesus Christ. And he will provide you not only with protection from the wrath of God, but way more important, you will experience the joy and blessings and peace that comes from knowing your Lord and Savior. And so that's exactly the right attitude is to share the gospel with a sense of urgency. No doubt about it. And then you asked about the, uh, what we will be doing in the, in the millennial. We are Jesus' government workers. We are in our new resurrection body. We will go to foreign nations. We will go all over the world. We'll teach Bible studies. We'll execute Jesus' rule. So that means we will help people obey. We will teach them about the Lord. It's not like everyone that entered into the millennial kingdom all of a sudden knows the whole Bible. They don't. They knew what they knew ahead before. And we will teach Bible. We will encourage them. They will be schools. They'll be um, uh, cleanup work to do. And we will execute the rule of Christ on the earth. And here's the problem. Quit thinking so heavenly. Start thinking earthly in the millennial kingdom. What do you need to do? Well, there will be gatherings. 
Houses need to be built, rebuilt. Think of the devastation on the earth that needs to be put back in order. We're going to have to teach farming. We're going to have to build new cities. We're going to have to get people in new places of the world because now the deserts are growing. They have to go cultivate it, right? You get this kind of stuff? Think about how amazing that's going to be under the rule of Jesus, and he'll be directing every step from his throne in Jerusalem and tell him, put this earth back the way it's supposed to be. There's a concept in Judaism that is biblically right on. It's called tikkun olam. That means the repairing of the world. And we should be engaged in repairing the world today. But we will definitely be in the job of repairing the world when Jesus is back ruling on the earth. And that's going to be an awesome time. Pat? Are we going to be able to bowl when we're in the end? <laughs> yes. Give me that. The Holy Rollers will be even more famous. Yeah. Uh, my question was when I was reading 2 Thessalonians in the second chapter, just simply, does uh, that 2 Thessalonians 2.8 correlate with Revelations 19.21? And I'm looking to try to identify the uh, Antichrist. And what it says is when Paul talks about slaying him with the breath of his mouth in verse 28, does this correlate time-wise as late as Revelation 19, where it says their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding on the white horse. Yeah. Well, riding on the white horse, it's really clear in Matthew, or in Matthew, in Revelation 19, the one riding on the white horse is Jesus. Absolutely. The king of kings, it's written on him. And so he comes back and defeats the enemies of the king, the enemies of the kingdom, with the breath of his mouth. So I absolutely believe that this is exactly the same picture here. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.8 says, And then the lawless one will be revealed. This is the Antichrist. Whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendoring of his coming. So that seems to me like, I mean, we can get the picture. Jesus blows on him and he falls over. So that could be it. But actually what I think is it's like, you're dead. <laughs> you're out of here. You lose. Whatever he says, he wins. And just like he said, let there be light, and there was light, he will say, let there be victory, and there will be victory. So, yeah, great question. Someone else. We have a few minutes. This, this kind of a question, maybe. <laughs> um, I, I also believe pre, um, pre-rapture. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I also know through reading scripture that Christ, uh, God leaves a remnant. And I'm wondering, I know that the two witnesses are going to appear mm -hmm. during that time. So are they the remnant or will there be other remnants? Remnant, okay. So the word remnant in scripture is related to Israel. So those of the blood descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So that's who we're talking about, descendants of Jacob, so the Jews, and that during the tribulation, the seven years of tribulation, all Israel will be saved. They will be saved as they individually, personally, put their faith in Jesus the Messiah. There will be Jewish witnesses who come, 144,000 Jewish evangelists. That's not, by the way, um, from the Kingdom Hall. That is not the Jehovah's Witnesses. The 144,000 or 12,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes of Israel who are evangelists who go all over the world to share the gospel with both Jews and Gentiles. You want to bet they take the gospel to the Jew first and then also to the Gentiles? Because that's what Paul did. But anyway, they're going to take the gospel all over the world. All the Jews who live through the tribulation will put their faith individually personally in Jesus and be saved. In addition to that, tens of millions, I would suggest hundreds of millions of Gentiles, 
Remember, right now there's about 8 billion people on planet Earth. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of Gentiles will have put their faith in Jesus as well as their Lord and Savior. And so the remnant are the Jews who are saved. And then the, the and by the way, there'll be many Jewish people who, are di who died during the tribulation. Some of them are martyrs who have believed in Jesus and they die. Some of them never believe in Jesus. But all those who live through the tribulation, um, Paul says, all Israel will be saved. And I believe they'll all get saved. So that's the remnant that are there after. So, yeah, that's oh man, just such a great question. Um, I could talk for hours on that. But those are the people, those believers who stay in their human bodies through the tribulation are the ones who populate the kingdom. They are the sheep when Jesus does the judgment sheep of goats. You follow what I'm saying there? And they then populate the kingdom. They have kids and grandkids and great-grandkids they live long lives. No, will, no longer will anyone be thought old when he's 100 years old, the Bible says. So they're going to live long lives. They're going to have many, many children, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. Some of those, each of those individually, they're normal human beings. Jesus is literally on the throne. They will each have to put their faith in Jesus and be saved. Some will reject him. Some will fight against him. He will have enemies during the thousand-year reign. He will put down every rebellion, bring them back into order. But during the, the uh, thousand-year reign, there will be believers and unbelievers on the earth. Now, I already have my new resurrection body. So do you, if you know Jesus. And so we are executing Jesus' reign the way, have, the way angels execute God's reign in heaven. You get that idea? So we are his ministers to serve all over the world. Some will be teaching Bible study. Some will be teaching kindergarten. Some will be fixing uh, houses, repairing houses. Some will be making cars run. Who knows what they run on, but they'll be running somewhere. We're going to get around because people need it. It's not, now, you and I may be able to transport from one place to another the way Jesus did, but they can't. They're humans, so they have to get around on public transportation and so on. You imagine public transportation when a plane never wrecks? How cool is that? Think about how it will be when Jesus is ruling this earth. Awesome. All right, it's 12. I want so bad. Lexi, one more question. You have One more time. Yes. Oh, I was wondering if the thousand year reign is it going to feel like a thousand years? Is it going to cuz like our like a year feels like a year. Is it going to uh -huh. feel like a thousand years? Is it going to feel lo like super long? I think that's a fair question. What we know in scripture is that it is literally a thousand years. He says it over and over. Before the thousand years, during the thousand years, after the thousand years, when the thousand years are done, this happens. So it's a literal thousand years. And I believe there, each year is an individual year. Now, to those of us who know the Lord, we're in a resurrection body. And I think time will seem different to us. But to the people on earth, it'll be a thousand years, real thousand years. So think about a thousand years. We're in the middle of the dark ages. Think about a thousand years on Christ. It's in the middle of the light ages. <laughs> Amen, huh? When the light is on the earth. All right, let me close with the so what. Hey, we can do this more. Uh, a couple of things I want to do. Um, I wish I could do this for three hours. I know, guys, I'm, I'm sorry. But um, a couple of things that I want to do is always use those prayer cards to put questions on. I'd like to um, actually have a little segment that we do every week or every other week where we answer questions. Because you have questions, you're sitting out there, and we don't get to talk to each other, you know what I mean, like this. And so... Write those on the back of your prayer card, and uh, I'll try to collect those and answer them as we have time to be able to do that. Um, oh, here, I don't need that. I need this. All right, so here's my so what. Margie asked, she, she wrote this. I'm, I'm picking on you, Margie. Thank you for writing this. While I do not have a question, I find myself praying, come Lord Jesus, more often when I see all the lost in the world. I also find myself praying more for people to hear and see the Lord, Amen. and willing for them to come to salvation while there's still time. Well said. What you said and what Cindy said, those hand and glove, perfect. Listen to what 
Paul says about our knowledge of the end times. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. For some of you, that might be the New Year resolution Bible verse that you grab and say, that's what we want. We want to live righteously. We want to be zealous for good works. We want to do that not to earn a reputation or to um, think that somehow we have to earn merit before God, but just because we love the Lord, we want to honor him. And so our hope, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, should lead us all the more committed to love him, serve him, share him with everyone in our life. Amen? Any study of end times that doesn't end with that idea is just a study in curiosity. Bible trivia, because that's what it's all about, Paul says. Father, just bless us as we uh, walk into this new year expectant that, who knows, Lord, 2022 might be the year when we are caught up together with the Lord in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But Lord, if that's not the plan, and if it's many, many years from now, Lord, we know that as we look for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord, we continue to serve you, to love you, and to share you boldly with others. May we do that this year to your glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for listening. I wish we had another hour to do this. God bless you guys. Have a great week.